Our next speaker um, is Associate Professor Brian Cox. Um, Brian Cox is the director of the Hugh Adam Epidemiology, Cancer Epidemiology Unit at the University of Otago, and his primary research interest involves the causes of cancer. His presentation will focus on what is the R value and why is it relevant to understanding COVID-19. Brian. Right, how do I look at that? That's the slide that they're seeing, isn't it? Right, thanks. I can pick that on. Well, welcome everybody. I'm going to start with a... First of all, Socrates said knowledge is opinion with evidence. When the evidence changes and the opinion doesn't, all you've got is dogma. And dogma is the worst thing that you can inflict on people as a teacher. So that's my first thing. As I always start historically, I tend to anyway, just to show you, actually there's been a lot of thought about all this sort of stuff for quite some time, and it all sounds very new now, but it's actually been around for a while. So I just put those two uh, pieces of information up. And you'll notice that Daniel Bernoulli, who really was the founder of the binomial distribution, uh, was a, a physician initially. Anyway, err is the thing. Or it can be irritation, it can also be uh, un being unsure. Anyway, R naught is the basic reproduction number. It's uh, sometimes it's got other names, uh, it's sometimes called ba basic re reproduction ratio. And it's used to measure the transmission potential of a disease, and it's sometimes mislabeled as called a rate when it's not a rate, it's got no particular units at all. It's the average number of secondary infections that are produced by a typical case of an infection in the population where everyone is susceptible. So that's our naught. That's why it's a naught, it's sort of like at the beginning, if you like, when everybody's considered to be susceptible. And for measles, it's quite high. Uh, and uh, it also is just the cases that it produces immediately, not the secondary cases, not the cases that those cases then infect. So um, it's, it's a state where no, uh, nobody's uh, immunized or has natural immunization. And uh, the Australian Department of Health make it a little clearer by saying it's, it's uh, in the absence of any intervention of disease transmission. So it's not a biological constant of the pathogen or the disease. It's affected by other factors in the, such as environmental conditions and the behavior of the infected population. So you can expect it to, if you have different groups of people, it will differ in, in those different groups. We'll get back to that a little later, if I remember to just talk about briefly about meat works and, uh, and uh, rest homes. Now, it can be calculated different ways. Uh, you, various assumptions are needed to actually make a calculation. The problem with um, mathematics, to some extent, is statistics, is we tend to talk in terms of averages and uh, the average person. Well, there's no such thing as the average person. I've never met anybody who's half female and half male yet. So it doesn't quite work all the time. Anyway, in terms of trying to get a some sort of description about what's going on, we, we tend to use to the idea of averages. And so in a homogenous mixing population, that's where I've got as much chance of bumping into you in Wellington as I have as the person down the street in Dunedin in the next hour, which obviously is not the case. So, so the, uh, the mixing in a, in a population is very often not that, though however, Within a confined space, like a prison, or rest home, or cruise ship, or meat works, then you can consider the mixing of those people to be relatively homogeneous, especially if they all sit down for lunch around the same tea room, for example. So there are instances when you can sort of assume homogeneous mixing, but in general, in terms of population at large, we're talking about heterogeneous mixing of populations, and we uh, we have to take that into account 
when we're doing any sort of modeling of the disease. So at that point, um, the simple equation at the top uh, no longer applies. There's several things that influence the reproductive number. One's the um, rate of contacts with susceptibles in the host population. It's not effective as how much people actually interact with each other per unit time. The probability of infection being transmitted during contact, which is also a combination of the agents, uh, transmission of the agent, which may be the agent itself or the mechanism, object or whatever else that is involved in the transmission. And also the host susceptibility of the infection becoming established. There's one thing for me to get the virus, there's another thing for the virus to multiply within me and cause disease. They're actually separate issues. Um, there's also the duration of infectiousness, but infectiousness can change over time as well, even within the period that someone's infectious. Uh, so, for example, in COVID-19, people are much more infectious when they're coughing and sneezing and have symptoms than in the two days prior, though they're still infectious within the two days prior. In fact, uh, in that asymptomatic phase, uh, people are most infectious uh, 0.7 of a day before they get symptoms. So uh, that means that contacts within the two days prior to the person getting symptoms are important. The duration of infectiousness, um, and that can vary by the time uh, since people are infected. You're not necessarily, when I'm, inf when, if I was infected, as I said before, people, when they've got symptoms and are coughing and sneezing, are much more infectious than prior to that, even though they may be, have some infectiousness. So, in general, the whole idea is a susceptible, um, in the susceptible population, R0 must be greater than zero. And I say in general, because there are some funny exceptions or circumstances where it doesn't actually apply quite as rigorously or as regimentally as, as, uh, as is often put. In many circumstances, not all contacts will be susceptible to infection. But we'll get to that a little later. Now, these are typical values of R. Now, because R depends on the environment, etc., it actually differs for each outbreak of these different diseases. But in general, they're in this sort of range. So I'm putting up typical values of R in, in terms of the range. Um, we've got, and the different forms of spread. Aerosol spread, you'll notice, has very large values of R in general. Uh, measles and chickenpox, for example. Uh, we get down to um, the issue of droplets, which is really SARS, for example, the common cold, and COVID-19. And you'll see COVID-19, there are estimates of R for this, this particular table that I uh, took out of the literature of 1.94 to 5.7, which is quite a range, but important. Uh, and you'll see it's droplets. Uh, later I'll go on, uh, I might mention the issue of droplets a little more a little later on when we get into more detail. Now, you've heard about the herd immunity, threshold herd immunity, you might as well put this in. This is a, a simple equation that gives you an idea of the threshold at which herd immunity kicks in. Now, there's the proportion of people who have to be immune or recovered immune, sorry, uh, for um, the disease to start um, reducing the incidence to die away, if you like. So, for example, for, for COVID, if it's in fact uh, around an r of 5, then that would mean 80% of the population would have to be infected before you start having any herd immunity. If it's only two, then 50% of the population would have to have uh, the infection or been infected and become immune for there to be herd immunity. It's a lot of people, 
five million people in New Zealand, that's two and a half million people. And if uh, we have a mortality rate of 1%, that's, uh, what is it, 25,000 deaths or something. I mean, so it can be relevant. Uh, that's uh, a little simplistic in the sense that it appears that younger people are much less likely to die of it than older people. The basic re reproduction number is not to be confused with the effective reproduction number, um, which is sometimes a little bit more useful in terms of managing things on the week, day to day, week to week, month by month basis. So for the effective reproduction number, the uh, whether someone's infected or uninfected is, is, is not relevant. So it becomes uh, the average number of cases a, typ a typically typical infected person generates in the current state of the population, which does not have to be an uninfected state. And it's you can calculate it as a proportion of the R naught um, in terms of uh, the, the fraction of the host population that's susceptible. To eliminate the disease from population R generally needs to be less than one. Is that less than one that the one thing is what's useful in terms of assessing how you're getting on basically. RT is uh, sometimes it's possible to actually calculate uh, our effective uh, reproduction ratio during the as the epidemic's panning out in those and that helps to measure how effective some of your control mechanisms may or may not have been. The whole idea of R is, to, is an attempt to capture the concept that if people recover and become immune faster than people are infected, the disease will die away. Uh, that's essentially the concept. Now, to get it, the R value often needs some sort of model, especially when you've got heterogeneous mixing of the population. Uh, models are only as good as assumptions that, that they're based on. And uh, it's easy to think of them as some sort of black box that gives you answers. Well, it doesn't really. It gives you some answers that are all relative to all the assumptions in it. The thing about models is there's often a huge no number of assumptions in them and their advantages, you can cope with, you can put them in a model when you can't actually manage all these assumptions in your head all at the same time in their relationships to each other. So that's where the mathematics can help. Uh, often R naught can't actually be calculated absolutely. You end up with a, a measure which is a sort of threshold uh, rather than exactly what you'd like it to be, but it's typical modeling anyway. In a typical simple SIR epidemic curves, basically you've got susceptibles S, the infectives is I, and the recovered R. And over time, the susceptibles, some of them get infected, in this case, all of them get infected, um, and some of the infected, and just about all the infected recover, you're left at the end of in this case a uh, time of 100 let's say 100 days you end up with uh, a small proportion of people that are still being inf still infected uh, if uh, and you hope it doesn't get into any endemic state so that the, all the susceptibles susceptibles go right down to zero in which case the infection dies out now this epidemic curve which is the i the red curve is is a typical sort of epidemic epidemic curve um, but it assumes all sorts of things. It assumes heterogeneous mixing, it assumes a very continuous uh, ability of the virus to spread uh, quite easily. It's very, very uh, typical of aerosol spread of such as something like measles or, or whatever. Now, within a particular group of people, as I said before, you may get a very simple uh, epidemic curve like this within the sort of population group. So within a cluster, for example, you'll get this sort of pattern occurring. Uh, and that can be helpful. 
you can actually work it out uh, also as a as a ratio of the uh, the uh, transmission rate over, uh, times the mean infectious period, uh, which you the model generates. There are also some issues if you have a disease that has different latency periods, you've got to then do something a little bit special, and that occurs with tuberculosis when you're modeling tuberculosis, for example. Now, there are, may, there are different types of epidemics. And it's important whatever model you use fits the epidemic, the type of epidemic. Point source epidemic where someone uh, is infected and then infects other people, that's fairly straightforward. I showed you the curve for that before. But continuous source where this person infects another person and then they infect a whole lot of other people, you get a more sort of broader curve, if you like, with little bumps and blips along the way where you get different groups of people, if you like, small clusters occur. A propagated source, uh, one person infects a group of other people after a period of time and then they then infection jumps from them to some other group of people and you so you get these clusters so the propagated source epidemic there is very is the cluster based epidemic often with clusters you can't actually work out how someone in one infected cluster if you like has managed to infect someone from another cluster often the other group doesn't seem to be related to the first group at all and so you end up with a lot of clusters with unknown source. And you'll see that in New Zealand data of the bigger clusters that have been uh, listed. So this is a sort of propagated source and, and cluster epidemic. Uh, John Holmes kindly gave me this, a public health physician in Dunedin. Um, and so these are the different cases that have occurred. Uh, you end up with a red group, person one infects three people, person two, Manages to infect another person, five, and so on. And you get this sort of building up. What's important is the link between 20 to question mark. Dot, 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 dot. And then there's another cluster, starts at question mark. But you have no idea how they got infected. That's typical clusters, and that's actually very typical of COVID. And it means that. You Assuming some sort of continuous distribution of the spread of disease through the population doesn't work very well at all. And so you have to take a different approach. So you get cluster epidemics like this. Over time, you get different jumps. The second bump, there is several clusters that have come out of the first cluster which was after the index case. If you then fit a continuous distribution through that, you get a bit of a mess actually, and you try to extrapolate back to the beginning or back to the further out to the end. You, it's not very accurate at all. In fact, cluster epidemics stop suddenly. They don't tail off, they stop. And they stop because there's no longer transmission in general population and all the clusters are closed off and in quarantine. Suddenly the epidemic stops. Bingo. And that's sort of what's happened in New Zealand. Similarly, you can have a small group of cases that start uh, that you may, uh, may appear. Like in Italy, they had three cases on one day. Um, but nothing for three weeks afterwards. It appears those three cases came in and, if you like, resolved without actually transmitting the disease at all. And there was another lot that came in that actually started the epidemic in Italy. So it can be very hard to determine when the epidemic that went through the population, when it started and from where. If you do a continuous distribution to that, you'll then uh, pretend or the, it will then suggest to you that there was a whole load of disease before the first little group of three cases or there was a whole load of disease between the first three and the ones that occurred three weeks later when in fact it wasn't at all because it was a cluster-based epidemic. In cluster-based epidemics there's very very little transmission between people in the general population. The disease just jumps from one cluster to another and that affects R and how you interpret it. 
requires R within clusters to be considered separately from R outside of clusters. The transition rate in COVID outside of clusters in New Zealand was very, very low and is now zero. And because it was very low, lockdown was able, enabled us to isolate the clusters that we had and control them. In which case, there's no longer any jumping or very little jumping possible from one cluster to another. And we were able to nobble this disease completely. Providing we don't get any new introductions. But we should be able to contain those as well, but a lot of people have thought that in the first place with this disease, and it didn't quite work out that way, did it? So that's my piece, if you like. The issue, there is an issue about droplet size. I, I'm going to propose right here and now that I suspect that for COVID, you actually need quite big droplets. I think that might explain why meatworks have considerably high risk of transmission once it's within the workforce. People say it's because people are working alongside each other. Well, actually, yeah, that's true too, but there's a lot of industries where people work alongside each other. They don't all work in a damp environment. The droplets, after all, this disease started in a meat market, fish market, Wuhan. Uh, I don't think it's coincidence. However, it's my speculation, and we'll see what happens. That's, that's, that's the, the approach that I take in terms of R, and uh, it's important that whatever talk you have generates more questions than you had to start, than you started with, because that enables some people learning. I don't want to stifle any questions at all. Keep an open mind about everything. Thank you. Thank you, Associate Professor Brian Cox. And uh, there are certainly questions coming in in the name of this thing called learning. <laughs> First one being, can you comment on how face masks impact the R number, R0 in particular? I can't tell you exactly how that impacts it or whether it impacts it at all. Um, certainly if there's no transmission in general population, face masks are not going to do anything, is it? Because you're not either protecting yourself from anything or you're not infected either and can't really transmit it. So uh, at the current point in time, I don't think face masks are particularly relevant, actually, except for those that are looking after people who have COVID or people in quarantine. Uh, there are certain situations where that may be helpful. I'm a bit concerned that it's a nice damp environment if you don't change your face mask very frequently. It's also an excuse to put your hands near your mouth or your nose. Um, and I go back to this whole idea about large droplets, large droplets fall out of the air quicker. Um, and therefore your two meter rule for distancing work a lot better than maybe some other diseases. So face masks to me are still a mixed bag. Um, and uh, at the moment, because we have no community transmission, I don't think they're relevant. And a related question. Would your hypothesis on large droplet size have implications for transmission in more or less humid environments? Yes, I think it would. Um, one of the, the larger the droplet size, the longer it takes to dry out. Um, and once it's dried out, the poor old virus basically cooks. Uh, the other thing about droplet size is interesting. I think, I think there's been evidence to suggest that, that um, the virus is able to maintain itself longer on Things like stainless steel, which are cooler. So the droplets less likely to evaporate. So there's some, all sorts of funny little things like that that I think are relevant, but only time will tell in terms of whether that speculation, if you like, is any value at all. Thank you. Do you have any idea what the separate R values between and within clusters are for COVID 19? Oh, I think when you, when I showed you the epidemic curve, one thing about that form of curve, which is called a generalized exponential curve, is they're additive. 
So when you model the disease in the population, you're actually modeling all the clusters, if you like, added all up together. And so when people model the disease and come up with an R value, the R value they're getting is really the R value of people within a cluster or in a group. So an R value of three, for example, I think applies very well to a person who's infected either within the family or within a close environment like a prison or a rest home or that sort of circumstances. Then I think that's the sort of value that they are actually estimating when they're modeling it. That's what they're going to come up with. But in terms of the general population, I think the R value is extremely low if you're not within one of these clusters. I mean, myself and um, Phil Hill have suggested that you can think of a population as a whole of the people, but from a societal perspective, you can consider a population as a whole load of networks of people. And it's the networks of people, that, the number of networks of people in the population, which may be much more important in terms of assessing whether your cluster epidemic propagates and how much it propagates. So, um, and we've written something on that. We're hoping we'll see whether it bounces. We might find it's an old idea after all, but we'll see. Um, so, uh, I've probably lost the question there. I've rambled on a bit. Not at all, <laughs> not at all. One more has come in. How far into an epidemic is it possible to establish the R number? I mean, Ooh. does it take a week? Does it take months? Well, you should be able to get it, it depends how fast the cases accrue and in what circumstances they are accruing. You um, should be able to get a handle on that uh, within probably the first 100 cases you'd want to. You want to get it some sort of idea de novo from that. We are lucky in the sense that, I mean, China and other places had it first. So there's actually quite a bit of information out there before the virus got into New Zealand. So. Um, we were lucky, we, we could see this coming, we're an island nation, we watched it come and thought we could cope with it when it arrived. Well, that's what a lot of other countries thought too. And we, we, I think we missed something there and it's cost us about $60 billion at the moment. 